Welcome back. In the previous lecture, we introduced the concept of weathering and talked about how physical or mechanical weathering describes the processes by which rocks break down or disintegrate into smaller and smaller pieces. In this lecture, we will talk about two other forms of weathering, chemical and biological weathering. We'll talk about the different processes that transform the materials that make up rocks and talk about how weathering patterns can change the shape of rock outcrops. Chemical weathering is the process by which rock minerals are transformed into other substances via chemical reactions. Now, hopefully you remember from a previous chemistry class that a chemical reaction is a process whereby a substance or substances are transformed into a different substance or substances. And in this case, the original substance is called the reactant and the resulting substance is called the product. Some examples uh, that I have here, we have uh, a sodium ion, chemical symbol Na, plus a chlorine ion, chemical symbol Cl. And these two ions react to form the uh, to form the compound sodium chloride, chemical symbol NaCl. Now you'll notice that these are laid out like a mathematic equation. So we have uh, the reactants here on the left-hand side, and we have, rather than an equal sign separating the two sides of the equation, we have an arrow indicating the reaction that takes place. We also have this example here of uh, two hydrogen molecules combining with an oxygen molecule to form water molecules. Rocks are composed of minerals and minerals are composed of atoms. And remember to your previous chem chemistry class that these are the building blocks that we can't chemically split into their smaller components. So chemistry is the study of atoms and how they interact and react with each other. Now, atoms are composed of three different kinds of particles. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have no charge or have a neutral charge. And electrons have a negative charge. So protons and neutrons hang out in the small, dense center of the atom where most of the mass is. Uh, this is called the nucleus. Protons and neutrons have nearly the same mass. Um, and then orbiting around this nucleus, we have what's called the electron cloud or sometimes the electron shell. And this is where the electrons are found. So electrons have a mass of about one two, two thousandth of protons. Um, but they have an equal charge magnitude as protons, just the polar opposite. So we have here, as you can see, protons have a charge of plus one and electrons have a charge of minus one. And another thing to keep in mind is that in general, the number of protons in an atom is equal to the number of electrons. Electrons have certain energy levels. Um, we also refer to these as orbits or shells that they can inhabit. Each of these different shells can hold a different number of electrons all the way up to two times n squared, where n is the number of the, 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 number of the shell. Uh, but in general, we don't ever see more than 32 electrons in an individual shell. Um, so you can see here the different, some of the different shells. So we have the first shell, which is also called the K shell, and that can hold up to two electrons. Uh, we have the second shell, also called the L shell, can hold up to eight electrons, and so on. Um, the outermost shell of electrons is what is known as the valence shell. And in general, atoms want to have a full valence shell because this is the most stable configuration for them. Um, and this, this tendency to want to gain or lose electrons to fill a valence shell is what gives atoms their chemical properties. Um, 
Another thing to keep in mind is that the, the full complement of valence electrons is eight. So, so atoms want to either get up to, so add electrons to get up to eight valence electrons, or they want to uh, drop or lose electrons to get down to eight. Um, and again, which direction they want to go determines a lot of the chemical properties of the atom. I hope that you're all familiar with this. This is the periodic table of elements, uh, which contains information about all of the different chemical elements that we know of. And it's arranged in a way that lets you sort of quickly see some of the different properties of different elements. So the first thing to keep in mind is that we have the rows of the table. These are what are called periods, and they represent the number of shells that the atom has. And remember that we go all the way up to seven electron shells. The columns of the table are what are called groups, and they represent elements with simil similar physical and chemical properties. Um, in addition, each element uh, has a, an atomic number, which is just the number of protons that the atom has. So if an atom adds a proton, it, it is no longer the same element. It's undergone a change other than what we see in chemistry. Um, atoms can have different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei, um, and those at those atoms that have different numbers of nuclei are what we call isotopes of an element. Um, finally, we have this other number in this um, uh, other number in each of these different boxes with the elements, uh, and this is what is called the atomic mass or the atomic weight, and it's just the average number of protons and neutrons that all of the different species of uh, of that atom, all of those different isotopes. Has. So a number of different examples of elements that we will be looking at a little bit more in this lecture. Um, we have hydrogen, uh, which has a chemical symbol of just a capital H. Uh, it's in the first period, and it only has one proton and no neutrons in the nucleus. So it is the simplest of all possible elements. Uh, it also has a single electron. So one electron in its uh, valence shell. Um, oxygen, chemical symbol O, has a is in the second period, so it has two electron shells uh, that you can see in this diagram over here, uh, and it has eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus, or at least the most common isotope of oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons, um, and its electrons are arranged with two electrons in the innermost shell and six electrons in its valence shell. Uh, you can see what sodium looks like here in terms of this diagram. Um, sodium is in the third period, so it has three different electron shells um, arranged, as you can see there. And chlorine is also in the uh, third period, uh, so it has three electron shells, and you can see how they're arranged here. We can also represent the elements as a dot diagram. So this is where we are uh, placing a dot around the chemical symbol for each of the electrons that occupy the valence shell of the atom. So remember that we go all the way up to eight valence electrons uh, that you can see here in, um, well, here it's listed as group eight, but this is the, uh, fur the furthest right column of the periodic table, uh, which is also, you might remember, known as the noble gases. These are gases that do not react with other elements because they have a full complement of uh, electrons in their valence shell. Um, but you can see as we go from left to right across the table, the elements in each of the columns or each of the groups all have the same number of valence electrons. So starting here in group one, we have one valence electron. Group two, we have two. Group three, or at least as it's labeled in this diagram, we have three electrons uh, and so on. So remember that each of the, um, 
each of the different elements in a group have similar properties because they have similar amounts, of, they have a similar number of electrons in their valence shell. A chemical bond is the process of sharing or transferring electrons that enables each of the atoms involved in the reaction to have a full valence shell. So when two atoms swap electrons, they form what is known as, a, as an ionic bond. Uh, the element that gives up the electron now has a net positive charge. We call this a cation. The element that gains an electron now has a net negative charge, and we call this an anion. We can see this with the formation of sodium chloride from its constituent elements sodium and chlorine. Uh, and we write this we write this reaction like this, where we have Na, the chemical symbol for sodium, with a little plus sign uh, raised or a superscript plus sign on it as well as chlorine having a superscript minus sign to indicate that they are, uh, that these are ions, so they have a net charge associated with them. So we have sodium here, which has 11 electrons and a single electron in its valence shell. We have chlorine with 17 electrons, and, a, and we have seven electrons in its valence shell. So sodium wants to give up one electron to get a full complement of eight valence electrons. Likewise, chlorine wants to gain an electron in order to get a full complement of eight valence electrons. So when sodium loses its electron or gives up its electron to chlorine, we now have sodium, which now has 10 electrons, as you can see here as well as chlorine, which now has 18 electrons, and they each have then a positive charge for sodium and a negative charge for chlorine, because we now have one, for sodium, we have one fewer electron than we have protons, and for chlorine, we have one more electron than we have protons. These two substances can then combine to form an ionic bond, which you can see down below here. So when sodium and chlorine combine in this way, uh, they form a crystalline structure that looks, at least in a, a schematic sense, it looks like this. But it's important to note that uh, sodium chloride, even though the net reactant, or sorry, the net product here has no net charge, uh, the individual components so the sodium ion and the chlorine ion retain the charge that they had. Um, so even though so even though the whole crystal itself is neutral or neutrally charged, um, there are each of the different components are positively or negatively charged, and this has implications for how salt reacts with water, among other things. This transformation, this undergoing of chemical bonding, uh, also transforms the properties of the substances involved. So on its own, sodium is a soft silvery metal. It's highly reactive with water. It's very poisonous, not something you want to put in your mouth. Similarly, chlorine is a green colored poisonous gas. Um, but when they combine in this way, in, in this chemical reaction, we get table salt, which is something that we put on our food and eat all the time, and in fact need in order to live. If instead of swapping electrons, two atoms share electrons to obtain full valence shells, they form what is called a covalent bond. And we can see that with the example of water. So here we have hydrogen, which has a single valence electron that you can see here. And we have oxygen, which has six valence electrons. So oxygen is two electrons short of a full valence shell. So two hydrogen atoms combine with an atom of oxygen. And it does this by sharing electrons in what is called, again, a covalent bond. And you can see what that looks like in terms of the um, our orbital diagrams here. Uh, you can also see what that looks like 
And another way of, of representing this where we have the hydrogen atom here, represented by the chemical symbol H, separated by a single line representing a covalent bond with the oxygen atom represented by the chemical symbol O. You will also often see these dots around the oxygen atom in this sort of symbol. And what this is symbolizing is that we have lone pairs of electrons um, that are not, not involved in this covalent bond because it turns out that water is a polar molecule. So water actually has a charge to it. When we look at the end where the hydrogen atoms are uh, located, we have a net positive charge because the electrons here are being shared with the valence shell of the oxygen atom. And similarly, when we look at this side where these lone electron pairs are, um, we have these electron pairs that are not that are not uh, involved in this in this covalent bond, and so they are giving a partial charge or partial negative charge to the to the water molecule. So water has a net positive charge towards the hydrogen end and a partial negative charge towards the oxygen end. And this fact uh, gives water a lot of the really important properties that it has, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, so this is a good place to pause the video. Um, let me go and look back over a couple of the slides, and then we will uh, continue after the break. So just to review from before the break, a chemical reaction is basically how atoms exchange or share electrons in order to gain stability. So chemical weathering is just a chemical reaction between the rock minerals and some other substance. So it is just the, the exchange of electrons between rock minerals and some other substance to gain stability uh, in those different substances. Um, this process converts minerals into new forms, or it may release uh, different uh, elements or ions or products into the surrounding environment uh, in a similar manner to the way that uh, organic matter, as it's decomposing, releases nutrients and other things into the, into the environment. Um, this is a, a really important process. It's where we get, again, a lot of the different minerals that we, uh, that we need to sustain life. The major processes that lead to chemical weathering are listed here, and we'll talk about each of them uh, through the rest of the lecture. And it's important to note that while we're presenting these as separate processes, they are in fact very connected, uh, interconnected. And one of these processes can lay the conditions for another process to happen and vice versa. So the first process that we'll talk about is what's called dissolution uh, or how, so this is how substances dissolve in some solvent. So, uh, this process is the breaking down of chemical bonds by a substance called the solvent. Usually in nature is water or water and something else. Um, it turns out that most minerals are actually insoluble in pure water, so they don't actually dissolve in a solution of pure water. One exception that we've talked quite a bit about is sodium chloride, which is also known as the mineral halite. And because sodium chloride uh, has these still charged particles within the crystal matrix, so remember that we have a sodium ion and a chlorine ion uh, in this crystal structure, the polar water molecules, remember that water has a partial negative charge on the oxygen side, and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen side, um, these polar water molecules are attracted to either the sodium ions or the chlorine ions, which actually helps to break down the crystal structure of the halite mineral or of sodium chloride um, and dissolves the, the crystal structure, so it breaks it apart. 
even though most minerals don't dissolve in pure water, if we add an acid to water, so the definition here is an acid is just a substance that can donate a proton or form a covalent bond with an electron pair. Um, so if we add an acid to water, we can increase the ability of water to break down chemical bonds in minerals. Uh, it's important to remember too that a little bit of acid goes a really long way uh, in this process. And of course, acids are produced naturally in a number of different ways by chemical reactions in nature, by biological reactions in nature. Um, so it's not that difficult to find uh, something to make an acid. So one great example of this is called carbonation. This is the dissolution weathering that is caused by atmospheric carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide dissolves fairly readily in water to form carbonic acid. And this chemical reaction is written down here. So we have carbon dioxide, CO2, plus water, H2O, react or combine to form uh, carbonic acid, chemical symbol H2CO3. You may also see it written as a hydrogen ion plus a plus hydrogen carbonate. So carbonic acid breaks down calcite, CaCO3. This is the main mineral that's found in rocks like marble or limestone, and it forms calcium hydrogen carbonate. Um, so this reaction looks like this. We have Ca CO3 plus our carbonic acid, and these form the uh, these form a new mineral or a new product called uh, calcium hydrogen carbonate. So it's important to remember that calcite is not very soluble in water. It doesn't break down very easily. Calcium hydrogen carbonate, on the other hand, is very soluble in water. So this process, uh, this dissolution of atmospheric carbon dioxide in water helps sort of set the stage for further dissolution weathering by, uh, by water, by water that doesn't have necessarily so much carbonic acid in it. This can also lead to a process that is called karstification. Um, this is just the formation of karst landscapes via dissolution erosion. Uh, karst landscapes are characterized by lots of underground drainage, um, so not a whole lot of surface water running in these environments because it all penetrates through the, uh, through the bedrock uh, to go down into the subsurface. Um, so as a result, we can see lots of caves and caverns and sinkholes because the water is eroding into the bedrock and eating away at the inside. A really good example of this is the Burren in County Clare, uh, which has a lot of these sort of paving stones, so these flat limestone blocks that have semi-regular cracks that look like that look like pavement. They also have plenty of what are called solutional pockets. So this uh, this image down here at the bottom. Um, so these are just holes or uh, cracks in the uh, in the rock where water has pooled and eaten away at the rock and formed these sort of nice little um, these little pockets in the in the rock itself. The next process that we'll talk about is oxidation, or sometimes oxidation and reduction, or just redox. So oxidation is a reaction where one element loses electrons to another one. Reduction is the corresponding gain of electrons. A very common example is the formation of iron oxide, also sometimes called hematite, depending on the chemical formula, or rust. Um, so we see here this reaction. We have uh, iron atoms combining with oxygen molecules to form iron oxide or hematite. Um, so any rock mineral that has iron is susceptible to this. Uh, for example, we have lots of different mafic minerals that are susceptible to, to oxidation, uh, amphiboles, biotite, olivines, pyrite, pyroxenes. Uh, all of these have iron, which readily oxidizes in the presence of oxygen. Um, 
This also changes the color of the rock surface. So it usually turns rocks sort of this reddish yellowish brown color, uh, again, depending on which of the different, uh, depending on the, the different minerals or the different um, reactants, uh, the color might change. Um, but some different examples that you can see here, uh, the Grand Canyon is a really famous one. You have all of these really nice red, orange colored rocks as a result of the uh, chemical weathering of oxidation. Uh, similarly, at Giant's Causeway, we looked at the interbasaltic layer, so this orange stripe of rocks in between two different uh, basaltic lava flows. Um, so this is uh, basalt that has weathered over a period of time, I think around a million years, and it is transformed into what is called laterite, which is a sedimentary rock that is caused by or formed by the weathering of basalt and it has this characteristic orange-brown color uh, because of how the basalt has weathered. Oxidation reactions can also form serious environmental hazards. For example, if we have pyrite, this uh, iron sulfate uh, FES2, and water, we can form sulfuric acid and iron hydroxide. Um, or sorry, iron oxide. So this, this is especially common in areas where we've seen lots of mining. Sulfates are found in a lot of metal ores. And when the waste rock or the waste uh, products from mining are piled up, water can get into that waste and form what is called acid mine drainage. So this is water that is then oxidizing the leftover sulfates in the uh, in the mining waste, um, this drainage can then get into the water table or surface streams, and it ends up having a devastating effect on aquatic environments and organisms. And all of this is a result of the chemistry of the, um, of the different minerals that are found and then brought to the surface by that process of mining. Another important process is called hydrolysis. This is a process whereby water ruptures or breaks chemical bonds. Um, it's an important process that helps decompose or break down silicate minerals. Um, remember that these are the minerals that make up most of the continental rocks at the Earth's surface. So hydrolysis rarely occurs with pure water, but again, by dissolving other compounds, for example, carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide, we can form acids. And always remember, just a little bit goes a very long way. Uh, the example reaction that I've written down here is the weathering of granite, which is quartz and potassium feldspar. In this case, uh, it's the mineral orthoclase. So remember, Quartz is a very hard mineral, very resistant to weathering. Uh, potassium feldspar, on the other hand, readily reacts with water and carbonic acid. Uh, when it breaks down, it forms the mineral kaolinite, uh, which is a clay mineral, as well as potassium ions, bicarbonate ions, and silicic acid. Yeah, in all of these, all of these products here are found in solution. So that means that they're still dissolved in water. So this process of weathering granite or breaking down the potassium feldspar in granite uh, helps to free up potassium ions. They can then combine with the uh, bicarbonate acid to form potassium bicarbonate, um, which is a soluble salt. Uh, which can then be further weathered or carried away, transported. Um, it also can free up these potassium ions to be available as nutrients for plants and other organisms. Um, the silicic acid or the silica uh, that, um, that goes into solution as a result of this process uh, can fill up the pore spaces in sediment where it will then precipitate as chert or flint uh, or it can be carried to the ocean where it helps form the shells of microscopic organisms. So the quartz that's left over because it's very resistant to weathering and being broken down 
eventually either remains in the soil or it's transported uh, down to the ocean where it becomes sand and might eventually lithify to form sandstone. Um, so all of these different processes are happening as a result of the breakdown of chemical bonds because of water. Uh, we mentioned hydration in the previous lecture, and I said that this is a process that kind of lives right on the edge between physical and chemical weathering, because on the one hand, we have the expansion of uh, salt crystals, which causes physical weathering because it just causes fractures to, prop to propagate in the rocks. Um, but another example is that, uh, or another way that hydration can work is rather than having water molecules incorporated directly into the crystal structure of a salt, uh, it can combine as a hydroxide. So this is just the, uh, this uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen atom combined with a hydrogen atom. Um, and it can combine with other elements like calcium to form calcium hydroxide. Um, yeah, so this, again, can lead to further physical weathering because of crystal expansion, um, but we're forming new compounds. So it's, again, kind of right on this edge of the, the different processes. So I think this is probably another good point to take a break. Um, so feel free to pause the video, uh, look back over the last couple of slides, and then we will continue from there. Okay, so now that we've talked about the different processes of chemical weathering, so how uh, chemical processes help to break down or decompose rocks, we can also talk about how they change the shape of rock outcrops. Um, so in general, they, uh, because chemical weathering is working inward from the exposed surface, um, we get different rates of weathering depending on the number of faces that are exposed at the surface. Um, so for example, if we have just one face of this sort of angular block exposed, we're getting weathering that is only decomposing the surface on the one side. Uh, if we have an edge, weathering is attacking it from two different sides, and it starts to smooth this out a little bit. Uh, and it smooths it out even more if it's working on a corner where it's coming at, or where the weathering processes are able to attack the rock from three different sides all at once. Um, over time, this wears down all of the sharp edges and corners of these sorts of angular blocks and it produces these sort of rounded spherical shapes uh, that you can see in the diagram here, as well as this example here from the Giant's Causeway. Um, so as you walk down from the visitor center to the main causeway, uh, you might remember uh, at some point having seen these, uh, these weathered basalts along the way. So these are basalt columns, uh, similar to the ones found on the main causeway, but they have, uh, they have been weathered by this process of spheroidal weathering. So when the agent of weathering is living, so the, the thing that is causing rocks to weather or supplying the materials necessary for weathering, uh, we call it biological weathering. So organisms can contribute to either physical or mechanical weathering by exerting physical stress, which in which case it's known as biophysical weathering. Um, so this is where roots, for example, can get into cracks. And as those root systems grow, they expand, which physically breaks apart rocks. Um, if, the, if the processes are chemical uh, and the way that the chemical agents are being supplied is an organism, we call that biochemical weathering. Um, so the main way that organisms can do that is by producing chemicals that form acids um, that help to further the chemical weathering processes as we have talked about up to now. Um, and in this case, or in, in this sense, when I'm saying organism, what I mean is 
any living thing. So going from bacteria all the way up to humans, all of these different organisms can contribute to biological weathering. This is just an example of different acids that are formed by organisms. Uh, we have the names of the different acids here, the chemical formulae, uh, and then the source. So anything from ants to different bacteria, algae, fungi, uh, and so on. So I mentioned that uh, there are organisms that help to break down rocks by chemical processes. And in general, we call those lithotrophs. So these are microorganisms that get their energy by breaking down inorganic substances like rocks. Um, so some different examples, we have different metal oxidizing bacteria that get their energy by oxidizing metals. Um, some different example species, uh, you'll see uh, Acidothiobacillus, ferrooxidans. This is a bacteria that oxidizes iron or sulfur to produce either ferric iron or sulfuric acid. Uh, that's the, the product of the oxidation process that these bacteria help to bring about. Um, there's another species of bacteria called Acidothiobacillus uh, thiooxidans. This is a species that oxidizes sulfur to produce sulfuric acid. Um, Different bacteria or metal oxidizing bacteria can oxidize metal from ore, and they're often used for mineral extraction um, or commercial mineral extraction. So uh, a lot of mining uh, can be done by using these sorts of bacteria. And this just shows an example of some um, bacteria that have uh, oxidized iron in water and form this sort of orangey, um, this, this sort of orange uh, precipitate uh, on the bottom of this, this small pool of water here. Another group of really important biological weathering agents are called lichens. Um, they contribute to both physical and chemical weathering. Um, so in the physical sense, the uh, hyphae of the lichen, so this is kind of the, the root system of the lichen, um, penetrates into small cracks in the rock. And of course, as that absorbs water, it increases in volume and helps propagate rocks. Um, lichens also emit different organic acids. Uh, some examples include oxalic acid, uh, citric acid, um, so the, they, they can help break down rocks both in a physical sense, so they can make it smaller and smaller, expose more of a surface area, and then uh, further decompose the rocks by actually uh, producing acids to eat, eat the rocks away. Um, algae and cyanobacteria, uh, cyanobacteria are sometimes called blue-green algae, are also very important weathering agents. Um, they can contribute to biophysical weathering by increasing the amount and duration of wetness, uh, that, that wetness stays on a rock surface, which then leads to further physical weathering by wetting and drying, which we talked about in the last lecture. Um, they can also colonize fissures and invade pores, and then as they expand, they can help force rocks apart. Um, they grow between cleavage planes. They also provide nutrients for higher order plants like mosses and grasses um, that can help, uh, that can further weather rocks uh, in a physical way. And similar to lichens, they, and similar to lichens and bacteria, uh, they also, or other bacteria rather, they also produce acids. Uh, and they're often, they often show up as this sort of dark brown or black stain on buildings or on stone buildings or other uh, stone works that you might see. And finally, we have some examples of higher order plants and animals and how they contribute to weathering. Um, so here we have 
trees that are uh, growing into the spaces in rocks and forcing them apart. Uh, root systems of trees or root systems of other plants can also emit organic acids, which help to further break down rocks. Um, birds, especially pigeons in urban areas, um, their droppings encourage plant and fungi growth, which leads to all of the different biological weathering processes that we just talked about. Um, but their droppings can also contain organic acids, which help to eat away at uh, stone in urban environments, as well as natural environments. Uh, other examples of biological weathering agents, uh, burrowing animals like earthworms help to break down rocks. Um, and this, of course, is to say absolutely nothing of humans who contribute substantially to physical and chemical weathering. We break down rocks all the time uh, to quarry them for buildings, um, in mining, in roadworks, and so on and so forth, you know, we have we have a very profound impact um, on the lithosphere and on the planet in general. So that's it for chemical and biological weathering. Uh, for more things to look at or read, you can check out the video links here, which are also included in the description below the video. Uh, you can also review chapters three and six in the textbook, which cover some of the basic uh, chemistry that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, as well as uh, chemical and biological weathering. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks. Bye.